Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to get started here in just a minute. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon, Identifying and Staying in Touch with Homeless Students During the Pandemic. Good afternoon again. It is uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. My name is Barbara Duffield and welcome to Schoolhouse Connection, our first webinar of 2021, identifying and staying in touch with homeless students during the pandemic. Today we're going to be learning from the Navigator program in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping items. If you have a question during the presentation, please enter your questions in the questions pane and click send um, and that way we'll be able to see and respond. We'll stop um, a couple times during the presentation for questions. Please know that an archive of the webinar and all the materials will be posted at the link on the website. So you'll have all of that, um, as well as the PowerPoint is also in the handouts panel. And if you signed up for the webinar, you'll also receive a link afterwards uh, with a link to the recording. For those of you who are new to Schoolhouse Connection, we're a national nonprofit organization working to overcome homelessness through education. We do work on policy at the state and federal level, and we also provide practical assistance to communities across the country, school districts, early childhood programs, homeless service providers, higher education, families, and young people. Lots of resources on our website um, that you can check out later. Before we get going with today, I just want to set the context a little bit. Um, at the beginning of the last school year, really in the summer, we began to hear from school district McKinney Vento liaisons across the country that their numbers of students experiencing homelessness were much lower than what they expected, particularly during an economic crisis and a recession, um, and the pandemic just generally having a hard impact on families and youth who are very vulnerable. So we conducted a national survey of McKinney Vento liaisons. Uh, it's on the slide that's on your screen here. You have a link to it. And there were four main findings. One was that based on uh, the liaisons who responded to the survey, there were an estimated 420,000 fewer children and youth experiencing homelessness that had been identified in the fall of this school year compared to the previous school year. Um, and so even and that, and for the vast majority of liaisons indicated that the reason for lower students, uh, lower numbers of McKinney Vento students was not a drop in homelessness, but rather challenges in identification challenges reaching families and youth experiencing homelessness in distance learning. Um, another major finding, while homeless overall student identification and enrollment was down, there was still lots of signs of increased need. So again, not an indication of, of less homelessness or less need, but rather real identification challenges. Um, we also found significant unmet needs uh, from internet to housing, food, childcare, and also that um, a relatively small proportion of, of liaisons were indicating at that time that COVID-19 relief dollars were being directed specifically to meet the needs of students experiencing homelessness. So this sort of sets the stage for what we know is a big challenge for many school districts, which is really identifying, staying in touch and re-engaging students who are experiencing homelessness and other students who have other challenges that are keeping them from participating in learning. So I was very excited um, not too long ago to see an article in the 74 million featuring Catherine Knowles, the Nashville, uh, Tennessee McKinney Vento liaison about a really great initiative that their district has undertaken called The Navigator. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Catherine and to Carrie Randolph, who is the Executive Officer of Strategic Investments to talk, tell us about what they're doing, uh, what they learned from it and advice for other school districts who want to, to take steps in this direction. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Knowles, and I am the um, Homeless Education Coordinator in Nashville, Tennessee, and I have been in that exact same position for 23 years. Um, so I'm grateful that um, finally I have something that I can share with others. So I'm, I'm, I was delighted to be invited today. And then I'll let um, Dr. Randolph introduce herself briefly, and then I will um, start the presentation. Good afternoon. It's great to be with you. I'm sorry my face is not on the screen. Um, just like so often in these days that we're in, I'm having a technical challenge there, but I'm glad you can hear me. But um, I'm sorry you can't see my enthusiasm for the conversation this afternoon. I am the Executive Officer of Strategic Investments. Uh, what does that mean? Um, federal programs and all um, federal grants as well as some others fall under me um, for Metro Nashville Public Schools. We have just a 
quick overview, we have about 82,000 students um, and are a large urban metropolitan school district. Great, thanks so much. And Barbara, my slide is still showing the main slide, so could you switch to the first navigator slide? I think I did. Does it? Do you see it now? No, on my screen. No. Hmm. Let me just. So I'm paused. Well, if everyone else has it, it's okay. But no, it's it's the same for me, Catherine. It's on the oh. first slide, and it's not in presentation mode. If that's helpful, Barbara. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Did it refresh? Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, and so um, at, we started the um, school year here in Nashville in completely virtual learning. We had a brief period after fall break where our some of our elementary, our exceptional ed students and elementary students came back for about six weeks. Um, but other than that, we've been in the virtual space. And so we really found ourselves as a district in August, um, in July and August, uh, focused very heavily on device deployment. Um, at that time when the school year started, um, the majority of our students did not have devices. We received some generous funding from the city um, to use CARES dollars to purchase laptops. And relatively quickly, we were able to get over 17,000 hotspots out to all students in the district. And um, I think 80 something thousand laptops. So it was, it was was that was the big push initially. We were also um, coming off of a tornado that impacted um, Nashville in March. So right before um, our district shut down due to COVID, we experienced a tornado that closed schools unexpectedly for a few days. And we really found ourselves as educators in the fall, really with deep concerns about how our students were really doing. Um, many of us had not seen them in so many months. Um, and um, we are now um, on month 10 of students, um, the majority of our students having not been in school buildings at all. And so the um, real push behind the Navigator program grew out of a concern, um, primarily among our educators and community of really how are our students um, in our community um, functioning and how are they managing and how are they gonna launch this school year? Um, I will mention that Dr. Randolph who's on this call. Um, it was, was brand new to the district. Um, she um, is my immediate supervisor and um, she started in very late June, and I think we've maybe been in person about five or six times. So um, she, she's a virtual friend of mine. Um, but so she really came into this role in the district and immediately had so, so much on her plate. But this navigator role and program really was something that she helped to push out. And she'll talk you know, about the importance of really having district buy-in and commitment to this. And Barbara and I were talking beforehand. Certainly the Navigator program is a district-wide initiative for all of our students. It just happens to have a very powerful effect for our students who are experiencing homelessness. So Dr. Randolph will talk specifically about um, the background of the program and really um, the rollout of that and how they got schools to buy in. And then I'll ch chime in and, and really have more specific stuff about McKinney Bento students. My assumption is um, most of you all on this webinar, that is your population or certainly a passion of yours. Um, so I will hit, hit on that um, more when I talk and then I'll let Dr. Randolph um, go over the next couple of slides. Thanks, Catherine. So I'll stick here for just a second. Um, Catherine did a great job of kind of previewing the real purpose and concern that created Navigator, it really was around this, how are the kids and how will we know? Um, and I, she mentions that I started on June 29th, I walked into a giant conference room full of people planning for reopening. Um, and that was my very first day on the job with people sitting far apart on um, at, at tables with masks on. Um, and I had the luxury of those few days um, to wander around and hear the concerns. So student services, what were the concerns? The academics team, the operations team. And the common theme was exactly, how are we gonna know that students have what they need? Um, and how are we gonna know how they are and how their families are? And I had um, just finished a graduate program um, at Harvard and worked with uh, Paul Revel and the Education Redesign Lab and the work of the BioMeans initiative there. And I had, had, had really been um, a thought partner with them as well as been a consultant with them to some communities and had been thinking for a really long time about success planning and the role of community in supporting students. I, I'm a firm believer that schools can't do it alone, right? And so how are we aligning resources um, and, and really thinking about a student 
as, as a whole person and all the needs that they have and making sure those needs are met. So I was coming in with that lens and immediately, uh, Catherine's point is really well taken that from the beginning, the district uh, leadership was very excited about this idea. It was driven out of this felt need, but there'd been a lot of talk about this prior. And um, really the conversation was, we have to do this. The time right now means we can't wait. We've been talking about it for a while, what it could look like. So that's really, um, if, if I can say that there's anything good about maybe this time that we're in, it's really hard to imagine that, but I do think it sparked some innovative thinking and some quick action of things actually we should have been doing all along in a lot of ways. And I would, I would place Navigator there, as does district leadership. So really it is about connecting each student to a path of success. Right now it has been focused on um, kind of even some basic needs. We are, we can talk more if you're interested about the, the future of the program, but this is how we described it from the beginning. So a navigator is someone at the school. It does not have to be a teacher. We can talk more about that as well, but it has to be somebody who can build strong relationships with a student. They're a mentor and advocate for that student. They're a connector for that student. They don't have to have all the answers, but they're committed to helping that student find the resource and support that's needed. And originally, we really talked about this as being part of the, the staff, a school staff member's job. These are, from the beginning, we talked about, you know, these are conversations you'd have in the hall or you'd be concerned about a student and talk to them after class or, you know, all those things that we knew weren't happening because we were in the virtual space, they wouldn't happen unless we were intentional. So um, from the beginning, we created this as a 10 minute weekly check-in. You can change the slide, Barbara, thank you. So this is a quick diagram. You can see my mad design skills here. But if you imagine the, the navigator in the center, again, that's somebody at the school who can build a strong relationship with the student. They have some support. Um, usually the support team at the school consists of the school counselor, the social worker, an administrator, um, and sometimes there's a lead teacher involved as well. That person's supporting the navigator. The navigator either connects through that um, lead navigator to the social worker counselor as needed or to the student's teacher. They work with a small cohort of students, but one-on-one. -on -one. So the caseload, if you'd like to call it that, for a navigator, we really have worked with schools to keep between six and 15. 15 is, is honestly a little large, but some of our high schools based on staffing, right, that, that's um, about as low as they can get it. So we encourage schools to get that denominator, if you will, of navigators as high as possible so that when you divide it into that total number of students, you get the smallest number possible. We also created a data system, which I'll talk about in a little bit, because we knew this was a lift for everyone involved. I mean, our teachers, for example, who certainly were going to have to serve in this role along with their other colleagues at their school, um, had a lot on them. They were moving to a completely virtual environment. So how could we remove um, the barriers and make uh, the path to those calls and acting on the data that they were receiving from students and families as easy as possible. So we have worked to push in at the district level to support and the data system therefore was really important and we'll show you more about that. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, the why was super important. We spent honestly a, a lot of energy communicating the why to both the people, the schools, um, but also the community. And what's great about that is early on people got this, right? I mean, it was a moment in time where everyone was concerned about the things Catherine and I've mentioned. Um, and so really it was not a hard sell, to be honest. But again, lowering that barrier to getting those check-ins and building those relationships, we tried to do a lot of the heavy, heavy lifting. Um, so we created a handbook of resources, which honestly was mostly pulling from things that were already created. We created scripts for weekly check-ins. We translated those scripts into our top languages. We, um, to, just to make that easier, we worked on a translation interpretation system to support Navigator as well. Um, we created that data system that you'll hear more about. We created a really brief 
training video. I mean, our teachers were asked to do a lot of training. Our staff was asked to do a lot of training at the beginning of the year. So we tried to make that as flexible and supportive as possible. And when I tell you it's like one video and some documents, that's it really. Um, and I know that sounds crazy now, but it, it, it hasn't been easy every day, but it has worked. So I'll say that. We also made sure to link it to existing um, systems. So we have a collaborative referral system that's a part of our MTSS, and we made sure that Navigator was tied into those systems of support that were already available. Um, next slide. I'd also just like to talk about you know, how this really worked for a second as far as process. So there was this listening to stakeholders. I already told you how I listened to um, uh, the, the leadership in the district on that very first day on June 29th, that very first week and heard the need for something like this. But we also heard this need from families and community members were talking about this and certainly our students. So we had identified a need and challenge to stay connected with our students and we plan and we have partnered and this is really important. It goes back to that kind of operating principle that I have and I suspect I share with all of you that we can't do this alone. And so we've continued as needs have been identified to partner um, to address those needs, but we acted quickly. And we have the what we started with on day one of Navigator is not what we have right now. We continue to improve and iterate, and that process is continuing. So I don't want you, I didn't want this to be presented as a static system that's going to live like it does today. It's living today different than it did a week ago, I would say. And so really trying to create it from the beginning to be responsive. And I'll turn it back over to Catherine to dig in a little bit on what those check-ins are like. And so our next slide is just a quick poll, um, and Barbara had already touched on um, certainly the decline in numbers of reported students experiencing homelessness, but if you can just take just a second to think about during that first semester, so when you started school in the fall and when you made it up to winter break, um, what were your McKinney-Vento numbers like? Um, and we'll take just a, a minute or so for responses to come in. And Barbara and LeConte are the ones who do the magic on this. So I think at some point they'll yeah. close the poll and then maybe we'll see some results. It looks like we have 66, 70, 67% okay. who voted and LeConte's gonna do the, there we go. Okay, so you can see that the majority of us um, did have less than the previous year. Um, kind of my moment of confession is here in um, Davidson County. Um, we identified about 40% fewer students um, during this first semester than we um, ever have. Um, and as I said, I've done this for 23 years. Um, and it was really um, not shocking to me that our numbers were as low as they were. Certainly very concerning to me and very concerning to um, our administrators and our school staff. Um, and so we've experimented um, just within our team um, of a number of different ways to try to improve that identification. Certainly there are challenges. Um, as I've said, we've been virtual um, for, the, for the most part for all semester. Um, I have a mighty team of three. Um, and so we are three um, folks specifically devoted to McKinney-Vento. And in a typical school year, we have nearly 4,000 McKinney Vento students, um, so very small staff. Um, we rely on a lot of support from our school social workers and school counselors. And what we were seeing, um, as, as many of you were, I'm sure, is that when students were not in the buildings and they were not in front of school secretaries, school counselors, school social workers, you know, things were just going unnoticed and unreported. So um, as Barbara said, I always like to echo this. This certainly is not an indication that homelessness is um, improving, um, but it really is just those challenges with identification. Um, in the remote environment. And as I said, the Navigator program was launched not specifically for McKinney-Vento students, but it certainly great, gave us a great opportunity to weave some of these really important McKinney-Vento considerations into just regular everyday conversations the Navigators were having. So we'll switch um, to the next slide, um, just about launching the Navigator program. Dr. Randolph did a great job of really hitting the highlights of why our district felt so compelled um, to get this launched. And I would say the thing that stuck out to me um, as someone who's been in the district for so long 
is that there really was such focus on the staff and administrators that they needed something to do. And I think many of us in the midst of the pandemic, I mean, I know that I felt um, many days just pretty paralyzed about, well, what should I do? And I knew there was this long list of problems and a long list of needs, but I didn't really know um, or couldn't quite find the direction that I needed to take to take action. So the Navigator program really gave many of our staff real concrete direction on how they could take some immediate action to assist the students and families they were concerned about. So I think that's a lot of the power of the program. Um, it's, it's you know, often very easy to just feel like we're throwing one more task onto everyone's plate, but I think this was such a meaningful work for the majority of navigators to really have a dedicated list of students that they were going to check on, they were going to provide needs for. And so that really, I think, was um, one of the ways in which the program really sold itself to a lot of the people involved. Um, so certainly the first challenge, and Dr. Ray and really minimized all of the work that she did on launching this program. You know, she talks about a simple training and we had great documents. I mean, it was a lot of work. I um, mean, she had a lot of people meeting with her on a weekly basis to really tease out what was everything we could provide to the navigators up front to minimize um, their discomfort or their anxiety about launching into this um, new initiative in the midst of a pandemic. So um, that um, the documents and videos and things we created on the front end um, were vitally important and, and certainly will be documents that we revise um, in the months ahead. And so the first challenge to schools really was identify who your navigators are. Um, as Dr. Randolph said, in order to keep the number of students each staff person was checking on as low as possible, principals were really encouraged to think far beyond just their direct instructional staff and think about front office staff, um, think about paraprofessionals and other people in the building who would normally encounter students in a school day and really task them with the responsibility of checking in with their cohort of kids. So it really was kind of a broad reach. Um, I think initially, when we when that was explained to principals, I do think there were some principals that came back and they had you know navigators with caseloads of 50 to 100 students, and um, Dr. Randolph and her colleagues went back and said, oh, that's probably not going to be very feasible. So they worked really hard to help schools see the importance of keeping these navigator caseloads um, small. Another suggestion early on was that the navigator be someone other than the student's primary classroom teacher. I mean, a lot of that was just an opportunity to give kids yet another adult in the building to connect with. And you know, maybe they um, don't have the best relationship with their teacher, their personality is not a good fit with the teacher, but to give them someone else in the school building that they could connect with who would be a reliable and consistent adult for them. Um, and then there was also um, some guidance given around um, not assigning social workers and counselors to be navigators, but giving them the flexibility in their schedule to provide support to the navigators, to be a resource to the navigators, but not necessarily to have their own student caseload. Um, so identifying navigators was certainly the big lift, um, and a lot of work went into that. Then after that, you know, the schools put their students into groups, assigned them to the navigators, and the navigators got um, I mean, fairly robust handbook. Um, we found initially, and, and I think for me as a liaison um, and as a social worker, it was a little bit surprising um, how much um, staff really wanted to be spoon fed, like exactly what to say and how do I really ask this? And, um, you know, okay, you want me to talk about housing, you want me to screen for homelessness, but how, how do I do that without, you know, offending anyone or, you know, so we um, did spend a lot of times a small group that met once a week, really crafting very specific scripts that if people really needed the comfort of having direct questions to read, um, they could do that. We encourage folks to have those check-ins be more of a conver conversational in nature. Um, some of the navigators connected directly with students, some with parents, some it was a combination of they would talk with both the student and the parent. But the main thing really was we wanted them to focus on connecting and beginning to build a relationship. Um, and so we gave the script and we gave a guide of what we hoped they would be able to cover each week. And initially it was really focusing on the technology aspect. And do you have the laptop and do you have the hotspot and do you have everything you need to attend virtual school? And then beyond that, we got into the questions about basic needs about food. And then the housing, I think was week three. Um, and uh, I think for the most part, for me as a liaison, it was so nice to have other people talking with students and families about housing and housing needs. Um, for so long, I think the, the automatic assumption is that with the housing issue, let's just refer it to our McKinney-Vento program, let's just refer it to them. But this really um, kind of empowered others in the district to have similar conversations. Um, I was very intentional in my training video about um, the script week about housing to really also include um, 
a pretty blunt assessment of what housing options looks like in Nashville because the last thing I wanted was for someone to talk to a um, family and say, oh yeah, just call, contact um, our homeless program and you'll have housing and it'll be, it'll all be okay. So I mean, we really did try to set the stage of what housing resources looked like in our um, community. And I think at this point, what I would say is I am anticipating um, once the eviction mor moratoriums are ended, I am anticipating that's really when we're going to see um, a lot of the benefit of this program because people will have already had some initial conversations with their students and families about housing, about the possibility that people leave housing and kind of normalizing that as something that we as school employees are concerned about. Um, and I also think it's great because they've started that conversation so then when they get to the point of needing to share resources it's not just like an out of the blue oh, let me give you this information they've, they've already established a dialogue around those issues um the so i think the point of training cannot be underscored and so what i um said what i was not prepared for was how uncomfortable um, a lot of our school staff so people who are very capable of standing up in front of a class and teaching math all day long really not feeling confident um, or comfortable in discussing issues related to housing. So um, I think um, you, know, under, you can't underscore enough the importance of, the, of that training piece. Um, I think the way it was communicated to students and families, we did have a little bit of pushback. A lot of people felt like this was, um, they felt a little bit like virtual child protective services and we were trying to um, invade people's you know, homes and spaces and, and dig too much. And so we really just you know, did a community education piece that this really was about supporting and connecting with students. And families had the option to opt out if they did not want a navigator contacting their student, they could um, choose that and then the students would you know, just be monitored more typically by classroom teachers and other school staff. Um, and then the, um, the check-ins is on the next slide and just in the interest of time, we'll maybe jump to that one. Um, and the format of the check-ins was really very, um, like I said, casual, conversational in nature, really focused on developing relationships with students. Um, certainly the conversations have changed over the course of the months that's, that people have been doing this. You know, to have the third call be, I'm asking you about your housing situation, a lot of people um, may not have been very responsive or open about that um, at that time. But like I said, as the months go on and those relationships develop, I think we're seeing you know, more um, rich and robust conversations really happening and taking place. Um, a lot of the, the initial issues were, like I said, around the devices and connectivity, basic needs in terms of the food services that the district was offering, lots of great referrals connecting families to other community resources, um, to COVID relief that was available, to school social workers for um, counseling and needs like that. Um, and I think more than anything, it was just that extra, I think so many parents appreciated that someone from the school was calling to check to make sure that this virtual platform that we had, you know, rolled out to them really was working, you know, okay for their family. We were there to, to answer questions and, and try to make sure that that was a positive experience for them. Um, the next couple of slides, I just want to show you really quickly. Um, Dr. Randolph mentioned the um, gathering the data and the reporting of the data. This was manufactured, you know, by the the evaluation and research folks who, who are far better at these kind of surveys and things than I am. But the, the navigator check-in that they where they record their not, their responses each week are just these quick, simple slides. It's drop down. So the first one, you're just getting information about the student. If you go to the next one, you'll see those content areas. Um, about what what were they asking about and so were they asking about food that week were they talking about housing did they talk about academic issues and the and the person completing the navigator calls just quickly checks yes or no or this wasn't anything that we discussed so it's not a labor intensive they're not writing a report they're simply just going down and kind of clicking through a checklist and then the next slide um I appreciate so much because it has the end action for what the navigators are going to do. So it's very easy for lots of us to contact families and, you know, have this laundry list of things that they need. But then, like, what do you do next? And so the um, the navigator report simply concludes with um, that they're going to submit a collaborative referral, which means they're connecting the family onto the social worker. Um, or the more critical answer that they can indicate is that they need help and they're not sure what to do. And so I think, you know, in thinking about rolling out any type of program like this. The navigator's not the end all be all, right? And they don't have all the answers and we don't expect them to solve all the problems. We need them to help us connect with families and to help families connect with us. And so I think, you know, being very clear from the beginning for, for to alleviate any unnecessary concerns kind of about the burden of being a navigator is you don't have to have all the answers. You're just helping us make those connections. And so I think, and so they're asked that every week that they do a check-in. 
did you submit a collaborative referral did you or do you need help with something and so i think that's critically important just in terms of supporting the navigators in their outreach with families um and then the next couple of slides dr randolph will take care of i um, mean it really kind of shows some of the um impact and um data that we got Thanks, Catherine. So again, this is a really simple system. What Catherine was just showing you is the simple Microsoft form or Microsoft district. So we created it that way. And the navigator, again, would complete that each time they checked in, even if they didn't reach a student, because that's really important to us. And I'll come back to that in a second. But this, that feeds into a Power BI dashboard that we can see at the district level and the school level leadership can see at the school level. So Alex Green Elementary is one of our schools. So all of the navigators um, enter through the, the form link for that school and it generates a dashboard like you see in the bottom right. And you can see it's those areas that Catherine was just going over. Um, and but the great thing about the dashboard is one I can see it at the district level so at any moment I can see where our biggest areas of need are across the whole district I can drill down to the school level I can drill down to different parts of the city and the district and I can drill down to the student level here so for example Catherine and her mighty team who are amazing um, can keep an eye on this housing um, stability question right and they can actually drill down to the student level the other thing this race for us, this is going to make sense to all of you, it's one thing for a navigator to check that box that a collaborative referral is needed. It's another thing to make sure that collaborative referral is created and followed up on. So when I was talking about before that we continue to iterate and change over time, we've created a system to check in on those collaborative referrals. We also now have, based on this, a list of phone numbers and students who couldn't be reached. Right, like there was a lot of rich data coming through this system um, that has been supportive of as we've tried to answer that question is how are the kids and how do we know um, and how are their families. We have created a second dashboard that I don't have an image of to show you today, but that is specifically for the executive directors who oversee our principals because there is a measure of accountability here that I like to call support because we have put out to the community that every student has a navigator in Metro Nashville Public Schools. And I will tell you as a parent of a Metro Nashville Public School student, um, I did not receive a navigator call for a long time and it was one of the measures I had for how well we were doing. So we are continuing to, we have an accountability around this. This is an expectation of our schools, but we are also here to support and we spend a lot of, um, time and energy reaching out to schools and we can monitor this through the dashboard, right? Who is conducting check-ins? Now I will tell you as an aside, some of our schools do not use this system. They had created systems of their own. So we certainly wanted to support them in that. So any of the data that I show you is, is excluding about 12 or 15 schools who had created their own system, but we check in with them periodically to see how it's going since they are represented here. Okay, next slide. So here's where we are. Um, I pulled this data, I believe, um, on Monday. So we would had 227,000. These, again, are underestimates because, again, we're, we are excluding 12, or 12 to 15 schools here. Um, that, that accounts for about 51,500 students, over 5,000 navigators. By the way, I'm not thrilled with that ratio based on Catherine's earlier conversation. We are continuing to work on that. But that has generated since August 1,800 collaborative referrals. Now, I'd like to talk about that number for just a second because that's where there's something that a navigator says that this student really needs support with, right? Um, and that the rate of collaborative referral generation from check-ins has remained constant. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me in August, I probably wouldn't have predicted that, to be honest. I thought we would see a high number in the beginning and they would fall off. So we are, we don't have great data to explain that, but we have two anecdotal pieces that we have some supporting evidence for. One is as the relationship has been developed, families and students are more apt to share some of the challenges like around housing or nutrition. We also know that our families are in changing conditions, the, such as the world right now. They may have not had that need in August, but they have it now. So um, this has been really important for us and has really helped. It's really hard to be honest for the community or our navigators 
for um, anyone to push back on this, that the need is still very great. We cannot take our foot off of the gas. So um, next slide. Oh, and I will add quickly, about 3% of students have opted out of Navigator. Um, a parent, if you're under 18, you can only opt out with your parent. Um, your parent has to opt you out. If you're over 18, you can opt yourself out. So I think that's an important number. Like only 3% of families or, or kids have opted out at this point. Okay, sorry, next slide. So I think um, this is, we'll just take a pause here. Before I looked for questions, and I certainly know that I have a bunch already, um, I just want to put a quick reminder in um, for those of you who are thinking this is great. How do I take steps? What to do about it? Um, actually, I'm, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to federal COVID relief in a second. I want to actually stop and take some questions now. Um, I just wanted to make sure that, um, hold on for a second. Let's see. I'm going to start with a question, um, and I don't know, um, Catherine, this may be for you, but um, how are you able to use something like this for youth who um, are unaccompanied, are unaccompanied homeless youth? Yeah, and so we, um, and probably those were the initial calls from navigators that we got most frequently. So it seemed like when, and, and like Dr. Randolph said, when we launched those first, I mean, housing really was technically the third week, um, the question you were supposed to ask. I think, you know, over the course of the relationship, it either got asked later or they asked again and it got a different response. But I would say initially, the majority of referrals we got early on were around those unaccompanied youth. And it was, you know, typically high school students and someone was reaching out to them and they were going through their story of having left their parents' home and couch surfing with someone else. So, yeah, we certainly identified um, unaccompanied youth through that. What was most interesting to me, I think, um, and I have that very narrow McKinney Vento lens, um, is I feel like, you know, each and every year we do a pretty robust training for district staff and we hit upon homeless unaccompanied youth and we remind people what that is and we remind people of their rights. Um, I think for me it was um, not surprising that many students were existing in that category, but no one was aware or no one had, no, had, had, had an opportunity to notice that. So I do think it was, um, you know, a great, um, a, a great benefit of having someone reach out directly to our youth and young adults and asking about their living situation so that they can uncover those unaccompanied situations. And in our district, our protocol is we then refer all homeless and unaccompanied youth to the school social workers to do more in-depth follow-up about the safety and security of their living situation. But I would say initially those really were um, the, the most frequent calls we got. A lot of um, those initial check-ins, I think it was people who thought they would be concerned about their housing down the road. They didn't, you know, when they were contacted in September, right then in September, they didn't necessarily have an immediate housing need, but they were grateful to know that, you know, down the road, if that changed, especially when many people thought the eviction moratorium would end in December, you know, people were thinking of it after the first of the year, I don't know where I'm going to go. And so we had to certainly be something to revisit at that point. Um, but I think initially, you know, we did um, identify a lot of other companies um, through this. That's what I, that's, um what I would suspect, but I was curious. So um, could you speak, to, since this Navigator program is not just for McKinney-Vento students, it's for all students, could you speak to how you chose students to serve in the cohorts? Um, is it with students with particular service needs or risk factors, or how are the cohorts chosen or selected? So I'll let Dr. Randolph speak to that. The cohorts, it was all students in the school, so all students were assigned to a Navigator. But Dr. Randolph, do you have any um, insight into how schools match students with their Navigators? Yes, and I also ha can share how we encourage schools not to match with the navigator. So, um, right, we from the beginning, for those of you that use like MTSS or RTI um, language, had to really push that this was a tier one intervention. This is for every student. We are not making assumptions about what students need or don't need. Um, and that was honestly, a, that was a barrier. I mean, we are still working with schools who still have in their head that this is for um, students they feel are, at, they use phrases like at risk or things like that. So from the beginning to, I encourage them to group students, as Catherine already mentioned, not with their classroom teacher, not with one of their classroom teachers, with another adult, and to um, really to be intentional about grouping in that you didn't want, um, it was by grade level, let me say that, but we didn't want one teacher to have 15 students that were of highest risk 
right across um, the system. We really tried to talk to them about workload for the navigator. Um, some schools, I will tell you, uh, did that great, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this, that great activity where you kind of put students' names on sticky notes all over the wall and everybody sticks a dot on there about who they know. Some of them approached it that way, like where were there already existing relationships um, that they wanted to build on. Some of our elementary schools in particular, because um, chose to match navigators with last year's uh, student, students. So like if a student was going from second to third grade, their second grade teacher was matched with them because there was a relationship there. So we left that up to schools, to be frank, and we saw very different things, but we tried to offer um, uh, suggestions as well as share some of the great work we saw happening among schools and their thinking around this. And here's, I'm sort of grouping a couple of, of questions together here, but um, this is about like how you are recruiting the navigators, if there's specific counselors or teachers, or just a little bit about the recruitment process processes for the navigators, identifying them. You want me to take that one, Catherine, or are you gonna? You go, you go right ahead, but the, I think the, the main message is the more the merrier, and we will take all comers, so. It is, I mean, we really, from the beginning, um, talked about this is about building strong relationships with students, and there are a lot of people on your staff that can do that. The, I mean, some of the most, uh, I think, some of the most heartwarming stories that we receive are from like a cafeteria worker, or front office staff worker, who's built a really strong relationship with a student and family. Um, so we really encourage them, like I said before, to get that denominator as high as possible. In order to do that, we had to break down some barriers. And I don't know how many times I've said, navigators um, shouldn't, the navigator pool at your school cannot just be your teachers. It cannot. You've got to think beyond that. Um, and there, there is some discomfort there. And I'm, I would be lying if I said we don't have some schools that are still doing it that way. But we continue to push them. Um, but where we've seen the most success at the school level is where this has become part of the culture of the school and everybody's involved. And so what we're trying to do now, honestly, is both support, encourage, I would, I would argue shove a bit, but we're trying to raise up those bright spots, right? And let the principals of those schools and the leadership teams and the navigators at those schools tell those stories to inspire their colleagues to think beyond kind of this limited um, view they have of maybe, uh, you know, what we heard a lot is some of them think of this as like a home room. Well, this is my home room. Nope, this, I mean, you may could argue this is home room on steroids, but it's a subset of your, of right? It's, we're talking six to 15 students. So how do you get there? So we have a lot of conversations around that. And I was and, say, I mean, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I do think for a lot of staff, it was an easier sell because they really wanted something to do. You know, if, you, if your job was to be a one-on-one -on -one assistant for a student who was never going to be in your building, you know, having a group of six students to check on gave you some meaning and some purpose to your day, you know, that, that quite honestly, a lot of staff people really were missing out on. So, um, I like that. I like the idea that it can sell itself if it's rolled out the right way. And um, I know you said that some students can, that students or parents rather can opt out um, and so this question is really, did every student in the district get paired with the navigator? There was at least, an, or was there at least an attempt to pair every student in the district with the navigator? And, and what does that look like now? Yes, yeah, so great question. Um, I mean, I could show you data over time that says, no, every student initially wasn't. We've had stragglers. We are getting close to 100% saturation. Um, we still have challenges. Some students aren't getting regular check-ins, for example. Some students, we have tried to check in with them and it's hard, so we quit. I mean, that's also, we've made clear not acceptable. We have to keep trying. Um, and that should tr trigger a collaborative referral at some point when you haven't been able to reach out to, to locate a student or find a student. Um, so we, we've continued to push on the things that we know work and again, provide support but also accountability. And it is now a signature initiative of the district. And so we have seen a ramp up in the last month. So some of the straggling schools is what I would call them, who were kind of, whole, I would call them holdouts. They maybe felt like it wasn't needed or, um, you know, our schools have a lot on them right now. And this felt like something else in some ways. We've seen them step up. Um, and I, so just as an example, I've probably had three phone calls today with folks about Navigator, really quick ones. But um, as we continue to try to push and prod and support, but we're getting close now. That's great. Um, 
and Catherine, I think you 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 alluded to this, but just to clarify, through Navigator, were you able to find students who were experiencing homelessness but hadn't been previously identified? In yeah, other uh, words, of course, yeah. yes, of, of course. And so, um, as I mentioned, our numbers were drastically down. That um, you know, typically in the month of August, we have you know 1,300 students by the end of the month, and we had you know fewer than 500. Um, so that was um, like I said, quite alarming. Once, uh, like I said, I think the majority, and so when we um, gave the navigators their script in that handbook, we did have very prescribed, um, you know, next steps. And if you talk with a student and this is their housing situation, um, you know, this is how you connect them with us. I would say that um, probably was one of the steps that maybe felt a little overwhelming or overly cumbersome to navigators at the beginning. So we got just a lot of quick emails of, well, I talked with this student, can you call them? And so we were happy to follow up on, on those calls. Um, I do think initially um, a lot of families did kind of hold back what their housing situation was. And we tried to, we essentially tried to take our standard student residency questionnaire, incorporate that into kind of a more of a conversational script that had people specifically asking more about doubled up situations. Um, but it's very hard in the, you know, in a five minute phone conversation, especially if you're talking with the third grader to figure out like, are you doubled up due to economic hardship? Or are you doubled up, you know, because that's your permanent living situation. So um, we really encourage that if you, even if you just suspect that it might fit a double up category or it might be something you must to follow up on, we're happy to follow up. So, so my staff and I um, made a lot of phone calls. And I would say initially from those first kids that were flagged as having housing concerns, a lot of it was that long-term housing concern of down the road, once this eviction moratorium ends, we're gonna be without a place to live. So um, as I said, I think that um, the steps we've taken um, up to now will be really critical um, as, as, as that um, situation changes in the months ahead um, and will at least um, have planted the seed to these students and families that, oh, so then now that housing is issued, that is something you can mention to your navigator and get some support and assistance around. Thank you. Um, and another question is regarding the assistance or the, has Navigator helped it with attendance, with increasing attendance? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to take that one, Catherine? I will let you talk about attendance, please. Okay. I mean, we have been all virtual um, for grades five through 12 um, the, whole, the whole year. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, had you know, some phase in of some students for a short amount of time. So attendance has been a challenge, I'm sure, as it has been for all of you. What we've seen with Navigator, it, it, it had, we still have our attendance supports and attendance check-ins. I mean, those are there and, and robust, but we've seen where Navigator is operating well and schools who've really pushed in and built those relationships, we do have some evidence of two things. Um, higher attendance rates, slightly higher. But what, what is more interesting to me in some ways is higher engagement. And what I mean by that, you know, when you measure attendance in the virtual space, we have a definition of what it means to be present in a day. Um, and a student does not have to be logged on for the whole time, or, you know, we know we have to be flexible because families are dealing with a lot. And so we, our attendance policy is pretty flexible in a lot of ways. They have to log on once and they have to show progress um, toward, you know, the teacher kind of certifies, yes, the student has done enough to be present, right? What we've seen in, in the schools where Navigator is working well, we've seen increased engagement. So in other words, they're logged on more, there's more touch points with that student. Um, and I think, I think that speaks to, you know, when you're in the, in the business of education, it really is about relationships. And so at those schools, they've used Navigator as the basis for a relationship um, where that student is, it, that they have created this like online community that's pretty robust because what happens is if a student's not there, you know, a Navigator might get pinged by their teacher to say, so-and-so, I haven't seen them in two days. Um, and that that person has a relationship that's, I would argue, different from that classroom teacher and can call and say, Hey, what's going on? Um, how can we help? So we still struggle with attendance, I'm not gonna lie, but we do have some anecdotal evidence. We don't have great correlating. We have some some correlation, I would say. Um, is it causation? I'll leave that to the researchers, but I do think we have some, some correlation. Great. Um, another question is to share a little bit more about the referral process to community supports. Um, what are the sorts of services you refer to? Do you, do you use a referral protocol? How do you handle issues of student privacy, confidentiality in making referrals? 
So I would say that's the um, Navigator Handbook that we put together really was um, like a compilation of all the community resources. So I think, you know, a lot of the things that people were needing was they just needed to know where in the community to get food help or to get diaper help. And so a lot of that was just providing, you know, agency name, contact information to families um, based on what their specific needs were. The collaborative referral process that we use in the district where we're really referring the students on to social workers and counselors and some of our other contracted mental health providers. Um, those collaborative referrals happen typically in a normal year. This is just a more um, intensive way to allow other a more broad um, spectrum of the staff to be involved in, in connecting families with those resources. So we have that internal collaborative referral process, um, you know, where we don't have challenges around uh, the confidentiality of student data because it's all internal organization, all internal players. Um, but um, but I do think, and I think Barbara even used in your little blurb about this webinar, talked about the number of um, needs and requests that were able to be handled simply by the phone call providing information. And I don't know, Dr. Randolph, do you have that statistic of how many of the um, the requests were able to just be handled by phone without any kind of additional follow-up? You know, we don't have great data on that because of the way that we collected the data, but what we do hear from families and schools is that absolutely, and that's gotten better over time because navigators um, have, have more background in that, right? I mean, as they've addressed needs, then when that need arises with another student. So in the beginning, there was more support needed from the, the leadership team at the school. So, which again, was usually the social worker, counselor, often a, an administrator. Um, what we hear is that more often navigators are able to handle that on their own because they know that resource now. Um, so we don't have great data on that, but just, and mostly that was the limitation of our data system. Another question is, uh, I'm going to, there's one like overarching question that's being asked many, many times and you, um, so I'm going to just collapse all of it and I hope, I hope the answer <laughs> is going to be yes, which is people really would like to have copies of your scripts. <laughs> they would like to have, to see the handbook, um, you know, um, just able to basically have, to be able to, I guess, um, have access to some of the resources that you've created so that they could maybe adapt them for their districts. There's a lot of questions around scripts and handbooks and um, having access to some of that. And yes. I, mean, I, should, I, should, I should have put the pressure on you by. No, by that's saying. okay. No, we're happy to share, right? I will say um, I, I've had this request earlier this week. So I'm creating a version that's shareable. And so give me a, a day or so and I will share that with you, Barbara, to share with the group. We're happy to share. And we also, by the way, our ask would be, we would welcome sharing back, um, suggest we are in a process of improvement. And I mean, I think this is an area where we can all learn from each other. Awesome, awesome. Um, another question is if in developing the system, you used any intervention strategies like check and connect, for example. I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, are you, Catherine? Yeah, it, the, the check-ins were really just like this open-ended script. You know, we were dealing with a lot of folks who don't have um, mental health, social services backgrounds, you know, so we tried to make it very not like a non-clinical um, kind of assessment and really just like you're really checking in. And then if there are kind of larger concerns, you're referring that on to the social worker or someone else um, who has um, a more um, uh, therapeutic or skill or a skill set um, more geared at, at, at those kinds of issues. I will add the really conversation and relationship. Agreed. And but I will add we did try to leverage some of the expertise in the district on from our social emotional learning team. They developed a lot of the again, I'll agree with Catherine. I was a little surprised at how much people wanted from those scripts, but they were really intentional about, you know, being uh, how those check-in questions and starting off each check-in with, you know, leading into it. So the, I mean, they were drawing off their their work um, and they would encourage mindfulness through it, right? You can see their hands in there. Now I say that when you see the scripts, you'll see this thread of um, folks who think a lot about social emotional learning in there. Great, and here's a question, and these are, there's like so many great questions. <laughs> um, um, do you have youth advocates working with the navigators? Um, this could help with language that will lead from getting more information from youth. I'm so glad you asked this question. We, uh, you know, we are a district of uh, over 150 schools, 
And I try to think of Navigator as letting over 150 flowers bloom or gardens bloom. And there has that we have seen some great things happen at schools. And we have a high school right now that's trying to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I'm just trying to support and share the work they're doing. They have put together a group of um, student advocates because they've recognized this need as well. It's new work, so um, you know, check back. Um, another question, I'm just going to keep going because I want to get to as many of them as possible. Did Catherine, her team, and Carrie roll this program out? How did you present it in order for it to take off in your district? I know you talked a little bit about that, but, but if you could talk a little bit about kind of that, the rollout and how you presented it in order to get the success that you've had to date. I, I can start, and Catherine, you jump in. And this is going to sound a little crazy. This goes back to what I said before that you know, I think with everything that's been happening and, you know, none of us know how to do school in a pandemic or, or how to do all the things that we normally do. Literally, I listened and heard and that success plan work that I had done in the past, I literally had a brief conversation in the hall with the superintendent. And I said, you know, I really think there's something we can do here. Uh, there's just this felt need. I think we can do this. And, and she said, okay, well, write it up. So I literally wrote up in one pager, um, but I think it was just this moment in time. And when people saw it, they're like, oh my gosh, yes, right? We need these intentional check-ins so we know how students are. Um, and, and it really was off to the races then. And so I was new to the district and I'm very fortunate to have Catherine on my team. And so I was like, Catherine, and pulled together some people um, and who who met every Friday, as Catherine mentioned, uh, we're about to kick, to start those back up. Um, but we met every Friday for 30 minutes to an hour. We talked about challenges. We, you know, and that's how the work really. And I can just tell a story of from the first meeting through the end of the semester, all the different things we tried. Some didn't work. We abandoned those and moved to something else. But it was really this core group. So head of of social emotional learning. Um, Catherine was there, the head of social work, the head of counseling would attend when she could. We had some school level, um, some um, school supervision level folks. It was really, honestly, this kind of hodgepodge of people who had raised their hands because they were passionate. Catherine, what would you add? Yeah, and so what I would certainly, if I had tried to roll this out as an Akiti Vento initiative, <laughs> it would have sat on my desk. So, I mean, I do think, you know, the real the real beauty of having Dr. Randolph here to present um, is this really does have to come, I think, from much higher up and has to come from that place of really, of a district really wanting to know what's going on with their students, right? It's not something we can just put down on paper and say, oh, yeah, we're going to check in on our kids and make sure they're okay. But it really was that, that perfect moment in time of, the immediate crisis that the district was in. And then, I, and I do think I mean, a lot of it was the beauty of having a brand new employee who had you know, a vision and, and, and experience and ideas. And so I would encourage any of you, particularly if your role really is primarily McKinney Vento, to, to go to your districts and reach out to social work, reach out to counseling and say, oh, hey, let's look at this for all of our students. Like I said, for me, it's, it's a dream come true to have um, other people in the district thinking about and talking about housing. I think heretofore the, the default has always been if someone has a question about housing, uh, send them to the hero office, send them to the hero office. And you know, we have information and, and knowledge, but we don't have all of the answers and we don't need to be the only keepers of that information. So I really um I think I also have learned through this process that I did a lot of training focused on McKinney Vento law and the rights of students and the responsibility of the district. And I wasn't paying enough attention to the personal side of that, the personal experience of that for students, um, and really trying to um, help staff and um, administrators see, like it really is vitally important for you to know what your students' living situations are, because that's gonna explain a lot about the challenges um, you know, that they, ha that they have during a school day. So I, I do think that as a mckinney Vento only initiative, um, it wouldn't have gone very far. So I think that, that having a, a larger group of people to champion this within your district. And, and I do think, as Dr. Randolph said in the you know months ahead, we will tweak this and we will um, it will take on, on new shapes and forms. But I do think we have some compelling data to really help you make an argument for why this might be something you want to try. Well, and I would be remiss if I didn't say this was part of the vision of our director of schools, Dr. Adrian Battle. I mean, this would never have moved without her. So I want to make sure, and I, and I want to tell you, this led to our current overarching goal for the district is every student known. And I really think Navigator inspired 
part of that. I mean, certainly it was on its way there. So we talk about that a lot as a as a value, like every student known, how does what this, if you're going to pitch something or talk about something, how does it relate to every student known, right? And I think known also has comma respected, right? Known, respected, and cared for. So, and Navigators helped us, I think, get there as a district. And you will hear everyone say that now. And that's a credit to Dr. Battle. So. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to just want to get a couple more questions in. Um, one is to do with what time of day does do check-ins typically occur and sort of kind of relatedly, do you use social media platforms in helping reach families specifically at the secondary level? So timing and, me and uh, method, I guess. I can speak to this and Catherine may want to add to it. Um, we have not, we'd never um, pushed a particular method on to navigators, certainly, or time of day. So I find when I talk to navigators, they figured out what works for them and works for the students that they connect with. And I'll be really honest with you, some of them in high school are contacting students via text. So that's how the student will respond to them. Now, if something is concerning, of course, they will they will reach out. So they can call them via Teams. We're a Microsoft Teams district, so they can call them that way. A lot of people do that when they're working from home, but a lot of them are also using um, the phone or they're they're even using Teams for not a video call, but just a, a voice call. Or we do, like I said, find a lot of texting going on with some of our older students because you have to meet them where they are and that's where they are. Okay, um, I am gonna ask, this will be the last question then I'm gonna just finish up with some closing slides and resources, which is, was there any pushback from educators that the navigator role should fall under counselors and social worker umbrella? Yes, and it's ongoing, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, uh, but, but I mean, less than I anticipated, to be fair. Um, we had some pushback from our teachers union initially but um, but then we had these strong voices that Catherine's mentioned of you know our navigators and people serving in this role just talking about how important it was to them too. I mean, we all got in this business to serve students and we're all separated from them right now. And so it was this kind of felt need. And we just had these really strong voices from parent, from stakeholders, from parents, from students, from navigators who included teachers saying, you know, this is my, this is so important. And this is my favorite part of my day, or, you know, it's taken many different forms. And, and over time, those have eclipsed the kind of, you know, this is this part of my job. I don't, this isn't supposed to be part of my job. And I would return to, to something I said in the beginning from the beginning, we really said, you know, these are the kinds of things that would normally be happening in school. It is part of our job, but we have to do that differently in this environment um, that we're currently in. So again, you heard me say, it's my part of my stump speech, like these are the conversations in the hall or after class or during lunch or before school or after school. Um, and I think that's resonated with people. Um, and I will say too, one thing I don't wanna, um, you know, it's not all ponies and rainbows, first of all, I hope we've shared that with you, but the initial check-ins take longer. And we had to really get people to power through those, you know, that those sometimes took longer than 10 minutes or there. And parents had a lot of questions, right? If it was a parent, a student had a lot of questions. They now would have heard, like, if you were to graph the length of the check-ins, for some students, they've gotten shorter. Some of our students are so desperate for connection that some of them are longer. And, and you, we have these really interesting stories of navigators like playing games with students via Teams. And, you know, I, I think um, people have found their own way through it. But, but I would say we still struggle with that question and we still, I get it at least once a week. But for the most part, we've gotten past that because of the value that we've seen for all involved. Thank you very, very much. Um, this is tremendous. Um, it's such a vision realized or being realized um, every day and learning from it. So um, thank you so much. And we will, I just have a couple more resources slides and um, and Dr. Randolph and Catherine, when you have things in shareable forms, we will um, email out. Um, and thank you very much for that. Whoops, I'm going backwards in time so instead of forwards in time here. Um, just real super quickly, um, I'm sure everyone knows there was another COVID relief bill um, signed before, in late, late December, um, another $54 billion. Um, money specifically can be used for McKinney-Vento services. There's got to be a, a 
uh, information provided by states in terms of accounting for learning loss that specifically names students experiencing homelessness. So just to call that to your attention, next week we'll have a tip sheet giving you some specific ideas. Of course, I think uh, launching a pro program like this would be an amazing way to use some of the COVID relief dollars and, and, and uh, deal with learning loss and so many other losses that our students have right now. Um, we already did the questions piece. A couple additional resources that are related to this in terms of identifying students during school building closures, staying in touch, removing barriers to online enrollment. So just know that those are some additional resources. Uh, we want to keep updating these as we hear of great strategies. Um, also want to let you know we have starting very soon a four-part mini-series on engaging and re-engaging students. Uh, Patricia Julianel, who many of you know, uh, my colleague, will be interviewing um, you know, one uh, provider or liaison or educator at a time in short interviews so that, um, again, it'll be a presentation of what they're doing and a conversation with them. So we know everyone's busy. You may not always have time for a webinar, but to check in on that. And just like everything else we do, it'll be recorded, it'll be archived. Um, so that series is, is coming up. Um, you have contact information here for Dr. Randolph and for Catherine. Um, and again, just wanna thank you so, so much. I'm gonna end the show here so I can actually um, see Catherine's face. <laughs> when you're doing GoToWebinar, the screen uh, takes up the whole the whole piece. I can't see everyone's faces. And thank you so much, Catherine um, and um, Dr. Randolph. And thanks everyone for attending. Uh, this was fantastic. And um, we look forward to seeing you all on a future webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Barbara. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.